Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Can we stand this morning? Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Why don't you turn to somebody and shake their hand and tell them you're so glad to see them this morning. Amen. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord, and we're thankful for this opportunity to be here. You know, a few days ago, uh, they said the groundhog didn't see his shadow or saw his shadow. Which one is it? I can't never keep up with it. But anyway, they what they said was that spring's coming. Amen. And so what that brings is tractors and tillers. People will be getting out, and, and they may already start it. I don't know. They better not have because that Easter always brings a good cold snap. But people will be getting out their machinery, and, and they'll begin to plow their fields, disc up their gardens, and getting everything, get, preparing that soil for the seed. Amen. This morning, Brother Keith's going to bring the word to us. Amen. I wonder if. While he's coming, if we couldn't just lift up our hands and say, Lord, prepare my soul, my mind. Break up my fallow ground, as the scripture says. And prepare my mind for your word, the seed of your word today, that it would be planted and that it would grow. Hallelujah. Come on, let's reach out to him right now. God, help us today. God, we want to receive your word today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here this morning. I'm excited to deliver what I feel God has given to this congregation. I uh, want to want to welcome Shauna and David. I not to not to make uh, put you on the spot, but I'm I'm very honored that you came this morning to hear me teach. And I hope hopefully God will speak to all of us through through what He's given me. I give honor to my pastor. What an honor it is to he trusts me to stand behind this pulpit. Second um, Corinthians uh, chapter ten and verse twelve says, "For we dare not make ourselves of a, the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves." and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. You may be seated. So this morning I want to kind of try to put a little bit of a little bit of a visual to a few scriptures in the, that 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 are in the book. I, I want you to visualize a little bit way over here on this this side here which would be your left as being sin dark sin now that list of what sin dark sin is is different for everybody in this room you know for some of you it, it, it would be the murderer the, the the abuser of people maybe the pedophile or or, or uh, the drug addict or the, the alcoholic or, or whatever whatever in your mind represents the darkest of sins and on, on the other side over here would represent uh, living according to God's word, li living according to, to what, what God says is right and what God says is wrong, living righteous and holy. But as you see, there's quite a bit of room in between the two. And when I read this scripture, I, I, I had to pray about it. And I said, God, I don't understand. What, what are you trying to say here? Because you're talking about uh, measuring yourself themselves by themselves i'm measuring myself by myself what does that mean and i'll tell you what i think it means and uh any of the theologians in the room would be be uh welcome to correct me 
But I believe what it means is uh, most of us here, have we've committed sins that we would consider to be over here. But what happens is because sin it has its pleasures for a season and it's fun for a season, as we get older and as we get a little wiser and we learn a few things and we get burned a few times, it is a natural progression for us to, to move away from that because we start paying the consequences of sin. If, if we, we see young people fall into this, whether, whether it be through alcohol or through, through drugs or whatever, and they pay consequences, and they realize that this is not for me, begin to move away from that. Or God can help you, and you, 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 you turn your life over to God, and you begin to move in this direction. But the title of my message today is to get out of the middle of the road. Because there's a danger of being here. Because now I'm comparing myself to myself. And I used to be over there. But, but I've moved over here. And I'm, 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 I'm a lot better person than I was when I was over there. And there's that tendency to pat myself on the back and say, I've come a long ways and I'm proud of where I've come from. And, and it is good if you've moved from a position in your life from, from, from there to here, to be proud. That is something to be proud of. But to be aware there's a danger in that because you can, uh, you can become complacent. And even though, yes, you've made progress from there to here, you're still not where God wants you to be. And until you get where God wants you to be, you don't need to be patting yourself on the back too hard. Celebrate moving away. But, but don't, don't come complacent and don't live in the middle of the road. Um, and then we have people who are comparing themselves to others. And I could say, well, you know, yeah, I'm not over there. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not over where maybe where I should be. But hey, look at all these. I'm 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 a lot further. I'm a lot closer to where God would want me to be than all these other people. And when the Bible's talking about sin and He's talking about evil and He's talking about these, things, He's talking about them over there. He's not talking about me, because I'm I'm over here. The Bible says if you're if if that's that's how you're deciding where where you are, if that's how you're measuring yourself, then you're a fool. I'm sorry, I'm not stepping on your toes. That's just, I'm telling you what the Bible says. We read the scripture. That's not the way, we, we, this is the only thing we can compare ourselves to. This is the looking glass. This, this is what determines where we are here. Uh, not, not, not just based on, on what others are doing or where others are or where even we came from ourselves. Some people would, would, would look and say, well, I'm a mile away from the world. Well, the problem with that is the world is moving. So next year, the world's going to be out there in the hall. And you're going to be where the world is today. So that's not a measuring stick. You, you can't base your, you can't be, feel safety and feel like you're pleasing to God based on your distance from the world. Because in the 40s or the 20s, the world was here. Now they're there. Next year, they'll be there. So, so you can't, that's not a measuring stick. The world does keep moving further and further. So, you know, not where I need to be, but better than I used to be is a dangerous place to get comfortable. Revelations 3 and 15 tells us, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. He's saying you're, you're, you're not cold, but you're not hot. He says, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked spiritually. But this scripture is telling us the same thing. Don't, 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 don't be here in the middle of the road. Don't be lukewarm. And I can tell you, as the world goes, the world keeps moving further and further away. What's in this book, what's right, what's true, what's righteous, it's not moving. It's staying, it's, it's staying exactly where it's, it's always been. 
It's never moving. It's moving over that way further and further. And as the, the further the world moves that way, the wider that area of lukewarm becomes. You don't have to be way over there. God, the devil doesn't need to talk you into knocking over the liquor store. That's not what he needs to talk you into doing. He just needs you to talk. He just needs you to lack that one thing. What did Jesus tell the rich run, young ruler? One thing, one thing you lack. He, he, he's okay with you being right here. As long as you're not here. Anywhere else is fine. And there's a lot of comfort in that. It's easy for us to fall into that. Um, and then again, we have people who are out there in the hall. And they're, stand, they're preaching that you're going to hell for using striped toothpaste and wearing wild socks. You know? Now, hey, if, if you've got a conviction against striped toothpaste, that's between you and God, and you honor that. I understand it's, it's some kind of wizardry. I don't know. You, you mix it up, it comes out, it's blue, it's white. I don't, I don't, I don't understand it either. But, uh, but honor God with your convictions, and I respect that. If you have convictions, I, I respect that. But when you get out there and you decide that, that anybody who's using striped toothpaste and wearing wild socks is somehow spiritually beneath you, now you've got a problem with your spirit. And we can't have that. And Jesus, he warned that about, uh, about us uh, comparing ourselves among ourselves and thinking that we're all that in a bag of chips. Uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse 10 says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus of himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the publican, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes under heaven, but smote on his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So we've got to be careful. It's not enough for us to just do the right thing, but we've also got to have the right spirit, and we've got to have the right attitude. We've got some to the farther right than us. Uh, but not being any worse than everyone else, it's not a plan of salvation. It won't get you right with God, and it won't keep you out of hell. Um, Matthew 7 and 13, Jesus talks about this same type of principle. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And pay close attention to that. Few there be that find it. That's not the crowd. That's not the, that's not the masses. It's not the majority. It's the few that find that narrow. And that word narrow, in the, in if, if you look up the original word used there, it, it, it's constricted. It's a restricted way. It's a narrow path. The danger that's in the wide road, and we know that the ride, wide road covers everything from here all the way over there. And this is the narrow road, that constricted road. Psychiatrists warn us of what's called the bandwagon effect. And if you're breathing this morning and you're human, you're susceptible to the bandwagon effect. And it's, it's, the, it's also called the herd mentality in which we're hardwired in our brain to do what everybody else is doing. We're, we're hardwired to, to follow the herd. And a, a psychologist say it's, it's a survival, it's, it's a survival instinct because if everybody else is eating this, then, then it's not killing anybody and it's not poisonous, so I can eat it too. And it's kind of where we come from. We, we look to see what everybody else is doing and that's okay. We can survive doing what they're doing. 
But you need to understand how it relates to the wide road because the crowd, the herd, is on the wide road. And you need to be aware of that. And, and you can be affected just as any. We want to be on the winning team. We, we want to be uh, in the crowd. We want to fit in. Uh, that's, that's what seems right. That's what feels right to us is what is popular and what everybody else is doing. And we can see it in the fashion industry. You know, it, it hadn't been too many years ago that, that if you had a pair of jeans that had big holes in them and, you know, threads, y you wouldn't even consider wearing that to Walmart at 3 o'clock in the morning. It'd be embarrassing to, to walk out of your house with that. You wouldn't even wear them around the house. But when everybody else is wearing those, and, I, and I'm not knocking anybody for wearing I'm just, just pointing out how our human nature is. Uh, but when everybody else is wearing them, you'll, you'll give half your paycheck to get, get a pair just because you want to you look just like everybody else. You want to fit in. And it's a perfect example of how that works. Uh, something that, that would have been bad if everybody else is doing it, it's good. That, that, that it's uh, acceptable. That's why mom and daddy always worried about who, who you're hanging out with. What crowd are you running with? That's why they worried about that. And that's still important at any age, even at, as adults. Uh, if you don't think that the people you spend your time with don't affect you, you're naive. Even as a child of God, even walking that narrow, straight and narrow path, who you're spending your time with matters. Proverbs 13 and 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Who you, who you hang around, who you spend your time with matters. But we're moving into a new time in which humans are disconnecting from one another. There's not that physical uh, hanging out with. There's not that physical herd as much anymore as it once was. Now we're being controlled more by algorithms. This, is the, this has become the herd. Th this has become what's normal, what everyone else is doing. This is where we get our information. And it is creating some very strange opinions about what's right and what's wrong. If you'll sit through a video that says the moon is made of cheese, then it's going to suggest another video that says the moon is made of cheese. And if you're intrigued enough to continue watching videos about the moon is made of cheese, after about 50 of them, you'll begin to think that maybe I've had this wrong. Maybe I've been wrong all along. There's got to be something to this i've just watched 50 videos and if you'll keep watching them they'll send you a hundred and after a hundred now you start to think not only is this right anybody that don't believe this is a fool because you, you it's, it's all everything on your facebook at the, in your world that you've created yourself by watching these videos it's, it's the number one subject of everybody. That's what everybody's talking about. That's the, only, that's the most important thing going on in the world is that the moon's made of cheese. And, I, I, you know, I mean, I know this is, sounds silly this morning, but, but I could have picked one of 15 or 20 popular conspiracy theories, and I wouldn't bring them up from this pulpit because there'd be people that would hate me because I'm not alone on board with them on those. And uh, some of them that we would have thought preposterous 15 years ago, there may be people here that believe them now. And I'm not, I'm not setting out to offend anybody, I'm stepping on the toes of your conspiracy theories. But what I am trying to do is point out, you need to be aware that, that, that our human mind is hardwired to want to follow the crowd. And these things are making a crowd into some strange places. And you need to be aware that you, you and I, we, we're susceptible to those same things because we are human. Uh, so I want to read directly what uh, psychologists say to do to avoid what they call the bandwagon effect or the herd mentality. And uh, this is not my words. I'm reading straight from them. It says minimizing the bandwagon effect can be a difficult process. Group thinking is difficult to escape, as are the biases that human are, sociologic, are socially prone to having. There are three simple steps you can take to minimize the bandwagon effect. 
Think critically. Consider how your positions, needs, or opinions differ from those around you. Rather than following what other people are doing, you can take an alternative or contrarian position while you explore your options. Number two, which would be number one in my book, look for a reliable source of information. Find ones that have been vetted on multiple levels or are free from or openly acknowledge their bias and do not make a profit on your choice. That's sound advice. Three is make decisions more slowly. After you gather information, give yourself a break from outside inputs. Don't go watch every preacher on the internet. Give yourself a break from outside inputs while you make a decision. Don't let someone pressure you into immediate choice. That's sound advice. Even though it has not talking about the wide road here, it is sound advice. I witness to people all the time and they pick a church because of the people that's in the church or the program that's in the church. They look at the functions that they have for the youth and all of those are great. But the most important thing is what doctrine do they preach? Are they preaching what's written in this word or are they pandering to the wide road, to the crowd, to the herd? Um, I wish that so many people, uh, and this sounds, you, you say, well, why would you recommend that? I wish they'd stay home and get in this book and decide what's right and what's wrong. Then find a church that teaches that instead of going, to, going somewhere that's teaching and getting full of false doctrine and getting ideals in their head that's not even in this book because they're, they're teaching, they're, they're going someplace that's after their money or they're going someplace that's catering to the wide road. Uh, and I don't understand, you know, how that we, we can read from Matthew to Revelation. Every writer warns us over and over about false teachers, false prophets. And most of their warnings are directed to the day and age that we live in, the end times. So why would you trust any man to teach you about God without comparing his doctrines to the Bible? And I'm not talk, taking anything away from true ministers of God and, 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 and uh, our pastors. You do learn from him about the things of God. But they still have to line up with this book. And they did in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. It says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonia, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And if you'll go read that chapter, the context there, their preacher was Paul. Paul was their preacher. But even though Paul was preaching to them, they were still saying, well, let's make sure that can't contradict nothing in this book. That can't contradict the scriptures. So if they did it with Paul, you better do it today. Um, there's a lot of good people on the road that's wide road. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of Christians on the wide road. There's a lot of preachers on the wide road. The wide road, it's all about comfort. The lanes are wide. It's paved with asphalt. Maybe seal-coated, Brother, Brother Wesley. I don't know. Uh, but there's peace on the wide road. There's peace on the wide road because you're moving in the same direction as everybody else. There's, there's a lot to be proud of. And you can pat yourself on the back as long as you're over here in the passing lane of the wide road. Because you're not over there, you're over here. There's a lot to be proud of, and it's smooth. There's so many people that they're closer to sin than you are. And you can help. You can help people on the wide road. You can help bring people from here over to here. But keep in mind, you're not helping anybody if you're not bringing them all the way to that straight and narrow path. You may improve their life. You, you, you may get, get them through a bunch of help, self-help principles. Their marriage might be better. They might be a better parent. They might be a better worker. But if you're not bringing them into the proper relationship with God, you would have just as well left them alone. In the span of time, in eternity, you just as well left them alone. Uh, not being over there, still not a plan of salvation. Uh, 
there's things that you hear from the wide road. Uh, the things that you'll hear said from the wide road are, where does it say this is a sin? I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't think that it's a heaven or hell issue. I just don't feel this or I just don't believe that. These are things you'll hear from that herd, that crowd that's in the wide road. But over here on the narrow road, the things you'll hear over there is, is this in God's will? Is this pleasing to God? Does God speak about this in his word in a positive way or a negative way? Is this wise? I can do this, but is it wise? These are the things you hear on the narrow road. It's not paved with seal code over there on the narrow road, Brother Wesley. It's got some, you know, it's, it's, it's got some sections that's dirt. It's got some potholes in it. It's got some hills. It's got some valleys. Everybody don't always agree with you. Some people are offended by you. But you don't pick a road based on how smooth it is. You pick a road because of where it brings you to. When you go to Dallas and you enter Dallas and there's, there's, there's four lanes of highway and they all start turning off to the right and that still small voice comes over the phone and says, take the exit to the right. You don't look over there and say, well, but these are nice cars. Those, these are, that, that's, that's nice cars and that's a good road and all of those people can't be wrong. They, they, they can't all be wrong. I, I, that, that, you don't even consider that because they're not going where you're going. You're, going in, you're, you're headed in a different direction. You're going to take that small, that, that small exit and that small road where not everybody else is going, but you've got a different destination. There's many professing Christians on the wide road who are worshiping a different Christ than you are. Oh. Uh, don't, 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 just give me a second. Don't, 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 don't jump on me just yet. Mark 13 and 22. This is Jesus talking. He's talking about the day we live in. It says, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, the very elect. We've all seen the boxer that they talk about, talk to. They throw the microphone in his face after, after boxing. What's he going to say? First, I want to thank God. You think God gave you the ability to beat this man in the head till he was unconscious? Not the God of this Bible. That's not the way it worked. Or we see the actress getting the award. They come up to give their acceptance speech. First, I want to thank God. You think God is the one that that, that helped you to get half naked and make that bedroom scene? Not the God of this Bible. We're talking, I, b I believe that that scripture is talking about that very thing. They're not, it's not man, it's not people walking around us saying that they are Jesus Christ. It's false gods that people's created up here in their head and they're worshiping gods that are not the God of this book. They're not the God of the Bible. So I want to know that I'm worshiping the right God. We can take this, this same type of example and we can compare it to the children of Israel. Over here represents Egypt and they had to leave Egypt. And over here, the living for God, walking according to this book in holiness is a type of the promised land. Uh, and this is why in a church we, we can't judge people based on where they are they're baptized and they receive the Holy Ghost they're not, they're not going to be over here they don't get teleported from there to here they've got to cross this wilderness area and they may be here but you know what what we can see is that they're here but what we can't see is are they moving in this direction or are they moving in this direction? Because as long as they're keeping moving in this direction, they're where God wants them to be. God's working with them. And we don't need to be judging people based on, on where they're at. And the way that works, we've all, every one of us, we've had to cross that desert.
to get to where we're living for God. Um, there's, it's a dangerous place. If, if, if you're in that position where you've, you, you've over here at sin and you, you've left, you've got the Holy Ghost, you've been baptized and you're, you're headed towards living that, that life, living for God, what it looks like is, boy, I don't like the way I felt when, that, when I said that. And God, the Holy Ghost convicts you and you say, you've got two choices. You can say, well, I don't know. I don't think that's, really, I don't think that's that big a deal. Or you can say, yes, God, I, I'm not, that, I, I, that's not something that's going to come out of my mouth. And you can say, well, uh, don't smoke that. Don't drink that. Don't, don't, don't take that. Don't go here. Don't go there. And your choice is to keep moving across that desert and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I feel that conviction. Yes, I know that feels wrong. And I'm, I'm going to walk, keep walking that direction. But when you begin to resist that, when you begin to quit, quit yielding to that and but quit following that conviction you're running a risk of dying in the desert because you the longer time you spend you're vulnerable in this desert just like the children of Israel were they were attacked from from behind from Amalekites while they were in the desert their their your defenses are not where they need to be yeah you've got to be in the desert you've got to cross the desert but the faster you cross that desert the better your chance of making it to the promised land and surviving is I'm just telling you the truth this morning. Um, because every time that you don't yield to God, when he says move, you know, move this direction, don't do this, don't do that. E every time that you do that, uh, when you don't, there's, there's shame and there's guilt and there's conviction. And you'll either yield to God and you'll obey God and you'll continue moving or you will get tired of feeling ashamed and feeling guilty and feeling conviction and you will walk back over there and walk away from it. There is a danger of spending too much time in the desert. Uh, yes, if you have d d addictions, God can instantly deliver you from those addictions. He can do it, but I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear. You're probably better off if he don't. You're probably better off if he helps you overcome it instead of instantly delivering you. Why? Because the children of Israel had six battles to fight in the desert. You know why? Because over here they were in Egypt they were slaves. They, did, they, weren't, they didn't learn how to use a sword as a slave. They didn't learn how to fight. They didn't learn how to battle. They learned... But for them to take that promised land, they had to fight. They had to drive out the enemy. They had to be able to fight. You learn that fight in the desert. When you're crossing, when you're, you're coming across that, that, that wilderness area, that's when you learn to fight. And God, God will give you the strength to fight. And it's better for God to give you the strength to fight. Just think about the children of Israel. God could have just, every time an enemy, the Amalekites come up behind them, he could have railed, rained hellfire down on them and just destroyed them. He, he could have he could have fought every battle for them, but he didn't do that. He let them pick a sword up, and he let them fight that battle because they needed to learn. They had to learn to fight, and they had to learn to battle. So if you're in that wilderness area and you're fighting some battles, the first thing you need to do is talk to your pastor and let him know the battles. Let him teach you how to make war. Don't let the devil come and take your lunch money every day, kick sand in your face. You know, the first thing you got to do is sit down and talk to him and have an honest conversation about what you're struggling with. Let him help you. You know, if you've got an addiction, there's not a bigger nuclear weapon than fasting to build your spiritual strength and your self-control. You've got to feed your spirit with the word and prayer. If you're not fasting, you're not spending time in the Word daily and, pr and in prayer daily, then quit scratching your head and wonder why you can't fight spiritually because th that's why. You're a spiritual wimp. You say, well, that's awful. That's awful. That's awful. Awful bold. That's awful offensive. Yeah, I want to stir somebody up today. 
because that's the attitude you're going to have to have. If you're going to make it, if you're going if you're going to fight across this desert, you're going to have to want to pick up a sword. You're going to have to get a little attitude. You can't let the devil just take take your lunch money and kick sand in your face every day. You're going to have to bring it to him. And we have spiritual warfare. We have we have tools to do that with. Uh, I love people enough to try to provoke you into fighting. Uh because you're fighting for your soul. And I'll fight with you. Your pastor will fight with you. This church will fight with you. You can make it. You can come across that desert. But you have to fight. It's worth the fight. And the faster that you get out of the middle of the road, the easier it is to live for God. Once you get to the promised land, don't ever go back to the desert. The desert is a place to die if you get back into the desert. Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't get over here on this wide road. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth at the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And, as, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft, chaff that is, that which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, the best life is over here. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the life that doesn't have the, the, there's such peace here. I experienced that peace this week. Uh, and, and, and I know uh, a lot of you know that, but I, but God has done a wonderful thing for me this week, and I and I want to and I want to give Him the glory and the credit. Um, I went to the doctor Monday because last week I, I had been been having severe urinary problems, like I had a urinary tract infection. But Monday morning I began passing large amounts of blood. And went to the doctor. They ran some scans, ran some tests. Went back Tuesday, still passing large amounts of blood. And he said, you, you got stones in your bladder. They cut your bladder up. Well, I take blood thinners. And I take, I take medicine that keeps me from stopping bleeding. It, it's anticoagulants. I said it wrong. But. So it's a very serious problem when I have internal, you know, internal bleeding. I'm, I'm not going to quit bleeding very easy. But he wanted to operate, but then he realized that because of my heart condition, he can't just he can't do that. I have to, I have to go to the heart doctor, and that was going to take to the middle of this month to even go see the doctor. And then even if when I see the doctor, if he thinks my heart could take getting off of the thinners, I've got to be off of them for ten days before he can do anything. So he sent me home in, in, in severe pain, bleeding, nothing he could do about it. Medically, there was nothing that could be done. And I stood here at this altar, and I'm going to tell you what I prayed. I asked God for mercy. You know why? Because when you read the scriptures, when you read the gospel, they didn't say, Jesus, thou son of David, heal my eyes. They said, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't have any doubt that God can heal me. He can do anything. You know, if he, just, if he just decides that it ought to be so, that's all he's got to do. He don't have to touch me. He don't have to say the words. He don't have to point. All he's got to do is just agree that this is ought to be that, that way, and it's that way. And I ask God for mercy. And when I work up Monday, uh, Wednesday morning, not, no, no signs of blood at all. And there hasn't been since. Now, that was a great miracle. And, 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 and my family, it was a witness to my family 
especially my wife, because she's, she was with me. She knows. She's well aware. She was very worried of how much blood that I was losing and no way to stop it, no plan. No med- the medical field has no, had no plan to stop that outside of a month from now. But God, God did that, and it was a witness to him, and I, and I give him the glory for that. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to take anything away from that, and I don't want to diminish that in any way because it, 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 it was definitely, when it's you, it's, it's, it matters. It made a difference to me, and I'm grateful. But I'm going to tell you what it made me remember. That's not the greatest miracle that God's ever done for me. Because I started on this road over here at 13 years old. I was on this road one Sunday, Sunday night. Brother Harold, who passed away this weekend, was standing right down here in front of the pulpit. And he said, if you have a need, I want you to form a line. I want you to come down that center aisle. And people that needed healings and people that needed financial needs and people that needed deliverance. I got in that line because I wanted the Holy Ghost. And when I got down to where he was at, the second that he laid his hand on my head, I began to speak in another language that I didn't know. It was like a bolt of lightning hit me. I had no doubt what happened to me. I I, I received the Holy Ghost. And I began to walk on this straight and narrow path. I was preaching at at youth, youth revivals, youth services. I felt a call to preach. I'd go to the church and I had a key and I'd get behind the pulpit. I remember the pastor's wife stepped, stepped in the back door one, one day and I was just preaching as loud as I could and it embarrassed me to death. I got caught. But, but I was on that road. And there's a difference in the people over there and me because I left this road and I said, I know this is not right. But I want, to, I want to fit in the crowd. I want to be like everybody else. I, I want to go over here on the broad road. I want to get in the herd and be accepted among everybody. I don't want to be different. And I turned my back on the things that I knew were right. And the devil didn't let me just stay here. He carried me all the way. He carried me all the way over here. But the difference in me and all the people over here was some of these didn't know any better. They'd never been taught any different. They didn't know the truth, but I did. And you know what? God owed me nothing. In that book, if God would have left me right here until Judgment Day, and when he opened that book to judge me, he could have pointed out and said, you didn't have the love for the truth, so I sent you a delusion. He owed me nothing. The mercy that God showed me was far different than he showed other because I didn't deserve it. Nobody deserves it, but I didn't deserve it because there's scripture that says I didn't deserve it. And why did he reach for me? I don't know. There were so many people over here in the wide road that are sincere. They haven't been taught the truth, but they're sincere. They're doing their best. He could have pulled any one of them. But he took a 47-year-old man that turned his back on him, that had forsaken him. I think about the pastor, Brother Harold, and I think about the heartaches and how the disappointments that what my life did for him and my mother that prayed for me. And I think, what do I deserve anything for? At 47 years old, done gave the best of my life to the world but he extended mercy. And I'm going to tell you, Brother Tuttle used a, 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 an illustration this past, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a sermon that I listened to. And he said, when a, if, you, if you took a, a steel ball the size of the sun and a little bitty sparrow flies up to that ball and wipes his wing on that steel ball once a year, when that whole steel ball the size of the sun is worn completely away, eternity will just be beginning. We we can't imagine what eternity is like. Our mind cannot comprehend that. But as much as I'm grateful for God's touch this week, 
It won't matter. What happened with my bladder won't make any difference in the world in an eternity. But God reaching over here and showing me mercy, going out of his way to put me on back on the right path will make an eternity of difference in my life. That's the biggest miracle he ever did. I, uh, you know, I, I was, I was, I had put up walls because I didn't, I, I didn't, I was ashamed of what I, what I had done. And I, and I didn't, I didn't, I was so far over here, I didn't even think I could get back over there. But God, through my son, who was my best friend, my fishing partner, my business partner at the time, nobody could reach me like he could reach me. And you know his testimony. He had a near-death experience. He almost died under a truck. An 18-wheeler ran over his leg, and, and he was inches from the drive shaft on a hill. He almost died. And he came to me, and he said, Dad, he said, if I would have died, I, I would, I'd went to hell. I don't want to live my life like that. What should I do? Thirty years I, since I've been over there on that path, and I see all these people in the middle of the road, and I, over those thirty years, I got to thinking, man, they're sincere in what they do. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's all in just, I don't know. Maybe they teach you things when you're a kid, and maybe you just don't see it no other way. Maybe it's just impossible to see it some other way. Can those people all be wrong? I, they seem so sincere. But he had never been taught anything. He studied with Jehovah Witness. He studied with Mormons. He studied with, uh, he went to Baptist Church. He went to, he, he's got family that was apostolic. He had a little mix of everything. And he had decided there wasn't a God. But the first step was he sent Sister Ruby. And I thank God for my daughter-in-law. Because I can tell you, me or him wouldn't be here if God wouldn't have, have, have brought those two together. She was a very important part of, because he was not headed in the direction of a church in any, in any way until he fell in love with Ruby. That, uh, I, I have to give her credit. And God put that together. She's back there teaching Sunday school this morning. God put that together. But he, he began a, a walk, and, and he, he asked me, what, what do I do? And I, the first thing I told him was, because I knew this was, this was a clean slate. There was no prejudice there in any direction. This was a clean slate. He knew nothing. And I didn't want to spoil the waters. And I said, son, I believe there's a God. And I'll, you pray to God and say, God, sh show me what's right. Show me the truth. Show me what I need to do. And you read your Bible. And even in the shape I was in, I believed that God would lead somebody without a Bible study, without some man showing you. I believed that God had the power to give you the truth through his word. It was within a week. He came and we were talking about it and he said, Dad, I read where you've got to be born of the water and the spirit. He said, I need to get baptized. And that was confirmation to me. That was all the confirmation I needed. Because I can tell you right now, there is a very small group of Christians in the world that we live in that believe to be saved, you need to be baptized. That is not the common belief. That is not what people think. But God pointed that and showed him to right into that direction. And I knew then, this is the truth. It was a confirmation for me because I seen it from a blank slate. I seen God bring a man to that revelation. He came up and he, he was had a meeting with Brother Burks and met Brother Burks for lunch. My brother-in-law, who's a mighty man of God, who I tremendously respect, came and taught him a Bible study and brought him to meet Brother Burks. And while they were going to lunch, I called my dad. And my dad made a comment, and through the power of the Holy Ghost, because it was what I needed to hear, he said, 
Well, why don't y'all go with them to church? Y'all not bad people. You're not. You, you, you're, you're not doing anything that would, would require a major change. And I can tell you to this day that floored me because I did not feel that way at all. I was over here. Church was way over there. I didn't even know how to get there. I didn't even think I could get there. And if I could get there, I didn't know what God would have wanted with me. And I didn't know what I could possibly do. I didn't feel there was any way I could get over there. My wife at the time, well, she's my wife. Don't, at that time, my <laughs> wife. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was, was on his deathbed. They had called in hospice. And my wife made a special connection with him, and he wouldn't eat unless she was there to feed him. And so she was going out of town every day and taking care of my grandfather. And I didn't know, and what I didn't know was that my grandfather, at the, the worst time of his life, on his deathbed, on hospice, was witnessing. He was reaching for a soul. He was saying, pray with me. She told me all this later. I didn't know at the time. My grandmother was showing her what a godly woman was and, and, and showing her the mercy of God and, and, and talking with her and witnessing to her. And the first time I was suspicious was she came on a, sun, on a Sunday. She, she, she was coming home every weekend and, uh, because other family members could help out that, that had to work during the week. And so she would go during the week when everybody was working, and she was spending, you know, helping. And but the first time I was suspicious, she said, uh, "I need to go today." And this was on a Sunday. She said, "I need to go this afternoon because I promised your grandmother I would bring her to church." And I said, "I don't understand that because first of all, my dad's there; he's going to church. My my brother-in-law's preaching at church tonight. My sister's there." Grandma don't need no ride to church, but I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it, but she, I thought about my, there's my grandmother, her husband of over 50 years on hospice, and she's reaching for her soul. She's witnessing. She's found a way. I need a ride. She found a way to bring somebody to church with her. Oh, that we can all have that. But so they, she said it was a Holy Ghost blowout. She's never been in that. She never experienced that in her life. No apostolic background at all. She she told me about it. She said, "Man, they didn't even preach. It was just it, it was just it, you know, she was she was she was really it, it it floored her." And after that, of course, that was going on with her. And at that exact same time. You know, Justin was talking to me about everything that Pastor was preaching, and what Pastor talked about at church. And he was going to church. He got baptized in the old church, and I didn't even go. I didn't even go to it. Then there was the wreck. And I got the phone call from him on a freezing night. I believe it was in January, am I right? And he said, Dad, we're okay, and the phone went dead. And I said, no, what, you, you don't call me and say you're okay. I, that's not a good phone call to get. And he called me back, and they had had an accident. And so I headed out to that accident, and I went down 63. And Brother Kevin can, can relate to exactly what I'm, what, what I'm talking about, but as I passed this point of road on the way out there to his wreck, there was a place where I know I was at an accident years before. And when you, when you're a first responder, you see, you see a cross on the side of the road, you know there was an accident there. When we pass that side, that point in the road, we see the accident. We, we see the cars. We see the, we see the people there. We know what happened there. It's a little different. I passed this section of road where there was a, 16-year-old girl that 
Don't know what happened. Something went wrong with the car, distraction. I don't know what happened. But she had left church on a Wednesday night before her parents. And she ran off the road, hit a car, hit a tree, and it, and it had killed her. Mom and Dad had stayed behind at church, and they, they were visiting with people. They left a little later. They got home, and their daughter wasn't there, and they remembered those, they remembered those, those lights. And, of course, they turned around and rushed back. And these things take time. They have to call JP. Out. He's got to get out of bed, get dressed. And they call funeral homes. And I don't know how much time spent, but that mother showed up. And as people held her back, she screamed, no, my baby. No, my baby. And I can tell you that as long as I live, I will never forget the sound of that mother. And, I'm, I, and I, it had to be an hour at least, maybe more. I don't know how long I listened to that. But it affected me, and it affects me to this day. It made me a better parent, for one thing. But I passed that, and I remembered that on the way out there. And I got there, and I did, of course, they were okay. They were beat up, bruised up a little bit, banged up. But I did what Brother Kevin would have done, too. I, I began to look, see what happened here. Well, here's where they went off the road. Land, flipped and landed there. Then it hit here. Man, it missed that tree and that tree and that tree. Then it rolled there and missed that tree and that tree. Any one of them trees it hit, they, they, would, there's, they couldn't have survived it in a Honda Civic. And then it began to roll out towards the woods. But when it started rolling out towards the woods, there was a section not as wide as this building, as this, as this sanctuary is, where they had logged. And they cut a clearing, no trees, to get in and out. It rolled right out in the middle of that. And I stood there, and I knew God had been dealing with me. God had been pulling on my heart. My son was talking to me, and I would break down and cry, and that old hard ground that, that I, in my, my heart had been breaking up. I knew God was dealing with me, but I didn't know how to get from here to there. I had no idea. I, I was way over here. And I, I, didn't, I, I didn't even know how to do it. I didn't even know how to get there. But I, I knew God was reaching for me, and I said, God, you got my attention because that was the second time my son had almost been taken from this world in a very short period of time the first one was the accident that got his attention the second one was the accident that got my attention so we're at the hospital and you've heard brother Burks tell this part we're at the hospital and we called brother Burks because they were going to church him and Ruby and he came to the hospital and he prayed for them and he visited with the family and they were all good they were going to be okay and when he went to walk out the door my wife said We'll see you Sunday. And I, my biggest objection was, how am I going to explain this to my wife? But you know what? God, he, he, he worked on her. He worked on my son. He made it so easy for me to leave here and go over. Why? I don't know why. I have no idea why. But he did that. And you know, my wife, she's, Justin began to talk to her. And he, he, he didn't even have the Holy Ghost yet. He was teaching her Bible studies. And she saw the need to be baptized. And we came home for lunch on a Thursday. And she said, I want to get baptized. And my son said, well, he was excited, yes. So he called Pastor. He said, Pastor, she wants to get baptized. And Pastor said, well, that's great. We, we'll get everything ready. The baptistry will be filled up. It'll be warm Sunday. We'll have... Uh, y'all come to church Sunday and we'll, we'll baptize her and she said no no I, I need to be baptized I need to be baptized today and pastor said well, well that's what he filled the baptistry up he called sister Stanley and brother Stanley he called a sister Kim few few people and on a Thursday night no church Thursday night we after, got off work and went to the church and she got baptized and at that baptism in the old church, standing right here, pastor came up, and I, I had a nicotine battle, and I had been defeated by that to the point that I swore I would never try to quit again because it created so much problems, and it was such an impossible battle for me. 
and I, it was one of the things I said, I just, I can't, I can't even do that. I don't even know. I, I had so many other issues. I didn't know how to get from there to here. I can't, I can't even imagine that. But he told me through the Holy Ghost, because he didn't know what my problems and my hang-ups were, but he told me, he said, you know, some people want to get God to get good. He said, but that doesn't work. You, you've got to get, you, 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 they want to get good to get God. They want to clean up to get to God. They want to clean themselves up and come over here, but you can't do that. You can't, you can't cross, you can't cross this wilderness without God. You, you can't make it. You got, you start here, but you've got to get God first. And God will take you just like you are. God will take you from here to there. But you're not going to get from here to there without God. If it looks impossible, that's because it's impossible. It is impossible. You've got to get God and you allow God. He will carry you the, all the way. He will help you and give you encouragement. Brother, Brother Stanley told me about Revival Radio. The first thing that I listened to was a God thing. Gordon Poe, I have blood on my hands. And he talked about David, and he said, David, you know, when he put that rock and he hit Goliath, and Goliath fell on the ground, the battle was over. David won. David could have declared victory right there and said, I defeated him, he's down, we won. That would have been the end of it. He would have still been victorious. But that's not how David worked. David said, you know what? Yeah, he's down, but he'll get back up. There's other giants. I may have to fight more giants, but that giant is not getting up. He went over there and he got a sword and he cut his head off. And that spoke to me about the battles that I was fighting. And it gave me the determination to say, you know what, I'm going to learn to battle. I'm going to learn to fight. I'm not just going to, I'm not just going to knock something down. I'm going to knock it down and it ain't getting back up because I'm not ever going to fight that battle again. Tomorrow is February the 5th and that is an anniversary date. 10 years that I, since I've picked up a cigarette. 10 years. And that's my anniversary is February the 5th. And so I know I've run over just a little bit, which is unlike me. Normally I'm, I'm early, but I thank you for your attention. And we, we've got a worship service coming up, and I'm very excited about what God's going to do today. I hope that what, we, what I've brought here is, has helped somebody today. So we'll have about a 10-minute we'll break, and then we're going to have a, a worship service. And thank you for your attention.